Fallout 76 is a game that is worth playing again. Coming from someone who, like many, dropped the game a couple days after release, I decided to return and I was amazed at the amount of quality Bethesda has put back into this game. It's easily worthy of being called a Fallout game again, and I couldn't be more proud to say that. Fallout 76 now has actual human NPCs, both friendly and hostile, engaging quest content and tons of bug fixes. On release, it left a bad taste in many players' mouths and mine too. It was sad to see a once great franchise be seen like this, but I wanted to give it one last chance and I'm glad I I did. So today I'm here to show you what 76 is like now, and maybe convince you to also give it one more chance. So let's get started. Fallout 76 on launch and even before its initial release had received numerous complaints from fans. It still to this day has a 52 on Metacritic with a 2.8 user score. Among the plethora of complaints, the few that stood out the most were a lack of polish as the game was riddled with bugs, no NPCs making the world feel empty, very little content on launch, and the content that did exist however was pretty much fetch quests, and of course, microtransactions. I went back to some old videos on 76 to see what the bugs looked like, and I forgot how awful this game used to be. I can say with confidence it's nowhere near this bad anymore. This game definitely still has bugs, but it's not even close to the ones from launch. A good example is enemies' guns not being centered properly and not seeing the lasers from the robots. This happened a lot on release to many players and to me too during my short time with the game back then, but I don't recall a single time this happened in my 100 hours on the game recently. As I mentioned earlier, just because lots of bugs were fixed doesn't mean the game is completely polished. Bugs still exist in the game, but I'll let you know that most are really not that bad. Most of the glitches I've seen during my playthrough only happen one time. For an example, as I was loading into White Spring Resort, my screen changed to a green and purple color scheme. This went away almost immediately after moving the camera. Another bug occurred during the encrypted event. The team I was with was not really equipped to fight this boss and we got stomped pretty hard. The more you die in the public events, the longer the respawn, but after some time I just couldn't come back. I was just sitting there unable to respawn. The only way I could fix this was leaving the server and coming back, but of course since I switched servers I never got the rewards for the quest. The fourth glitch was during the candy collecting event Monster Mash. Without going too in depth, you have to collect this helmet during the event. Something bugged out in my game, and I think it was because I decided to take the item instead of equip it right then and there, and that caused the mask to permanently stay on my character even though it was showing that it was unequipped on my Pip-Boy. Apparently this has happened to some others too, and once again leaving and joining a new server fixes the issue, as it's just a visual glitch on your side. The last of these glitches was during the Foundation questline where I was told to raise a flag and wave it. When I picked up the flag, it duplicated complicated, and I don't necessarily think this is a bug though, more the repercussions of a multiplayer game, as I think Bethesda did this on purpose so people weren't waiting one at a time to wave the flag. Next up is the more common bugs, and we'll be going in an ascending order, so the later we get into this section of the video, the more this bug occurred in my game. One I discovered was during the Brotherhood questline, and it was the naked NPC glitch where everyone around me is in underwear for some reason. As much as I'd love to say this was intended for the quest, Night Shin should be in power armor right now, and that's clearly not the case. This happened a couple times in my playthrough, and of course simply server hopping fixed the issue. One you might be surprised to see this low, however, is server crashes. They were in insanely frequent on launch, but I only had three throughout my playthrough. I want to separate the crashes from the game kind of just freezing, as this will be a little relevant later, but the server only crashed three times for me, one during my first 10 hours and the other two way later after having put at least 70 hours in or so. I'm not sure what caused these as it seemed like I wasn't doing anything crash worthy, so I'm still a little lost. Only one of the server crashes was a major setback, which like I'll said I'll get into later, but the other two were not terrible at all. I'd be in the middle of fighting people at some location, crash, then just go back to the location spawn point, which is probably like 20 feet away, so mere seconds of time were lost. The second most common bug I had is NPCs speaking over themselves, dialogue not starting right away, or not being able to interact with NPCs. I grouped these together as they're all somewhat related. I think the main cause of this is that I was going too fast when talking. For example, in the game there are daily quests that come back every day. This quest with the Helmlock Holes Cook is a prime example. He always asks for Radstag meat and Tato's. I have Tato's at my camp, and the nearby monument is always covered with Radstags. So I always grab these before seeing him as it saves me a trip. Because I already know what he's going to say, I skip through his dialogue constantly, so he tends to speak three lines at once. This is definitely my fault since I'm trying to force him to speed through his dialogue, so I'm not going to count this against Bethesda. The other is also technically my fault too. Once again, another daily is the photo opportunity with Davenport, who asks you to take some pictures with the two new factions in Appalachia being the Settlers and Raiders. 
Well, he rambles for a long time about the locale and where to go. Personally, I don't really care since I've already heard this before. Once you're finished talking with him, the quest should pop up, but since I'm speeding through his dialogue, it doesn't say that I have the quest. It's in my Pip-Boy, but the game never told me it was in there on my screen. This is just a variation of this glitch, as sometimes the quest won't be given at all. For some odd reason, Davenport is an odd one out, where no matter what, he will always give me the quest, even if I speed through his dialogue. Once again, kind of my fault since I'm going too fast skipping through everything being said. My workaround is to let them say a couple words, then skip as to not overload the game. The last one definitely sucks though, and it's NPCs not talking to you. The one example that comes to mind was right at the end of the Wastelanders questline with Foundation and Crater. I needed this girl Ra Ra to climb into the vent and unlock the door in front of us. The quest even tells me to do so, but for some odd reason when I talk to her, she only says random dialogue unrelated to the objective. This happened quite a bit, and I think what caused this was that while the NPCs were trying to get into position, I was screwing up their coding or something by attempting to talk to them early before they were ready. This happened with Chloe at Berkeley Springs. She has a quest for me too, but I tried talking to her and she wouldn't interact with me. Only when I waited and let her move to the other side of the street, she could then give me the quest. The only fix I found for this is to die, server hop, or wait until the NPC is fully done moving to speak with them. It's definitely really annoying, but not a crazy problem overall as I'm used to it, and once again, most of this I caused myself. These three bugs as a group happened probably the most, but individually, not too much. It was only really when I was doing the dailies, which of course is every day, but like I said, most of the dailies are the exception to the quest not popping up glitch for some reason. I wanted to mention this bug specifically because for some time I couldn't figure out why it was happening, so I wanted to share some of my thoughts for those coming back again so you aren't confused when this happens to you. Probably the most common bug in the game is NPCs in enemies in walls or frozen in place. This was honestly still quite uncommon, but just the most common one on this list. If you've played a Bethesda game for longer than 20 minutes, you'll know this isn't some new discovery. Bethesda as far back as Skyrim and Fallout 3 have had this issue, so I expected it to happen here. Although we've gone through all the bugs, I wanted to save this one for last, as it's a really good example when lots of bugs happen in a short amount of time. During the last mission in the game, you're supposed to launch a nuke from a missile silo. The last mission is very hard, as it should be, you're literally launching a nuclear weapon, so obviously I died a lot. It was a little infuriating, but I wasn't too bothered due to the circumstances. What bothered me was the amount of resets that occurred in this short amount of time. So I was under the impression that anyone who hops into this mission can do the mission with me together. This was wrong as someone entered the silo way later than me and walked right through the door that I was stuck behind. After I made it through the door, I noticed that the left and right way were blocked, so I figured that this blast door was supposed to be open, but since the player beat me to the launch room, I couldn't launch my own missile. So I had to restart the entire mission mission. After spending 25 minutes or so getting back to where I was, I made it back to the door, but the server crashed as I was walking around, so I had to try it again for a third time. The third time worked, but the game wasn't done yet. I launched the nuke and started the Scorch Beast Queen fight. Lots of people came by and we were doing fairly well, except during the fight, I crashed. Thankfully, the game has this really cool feature where you can rejoin your team if you crash during an event like this, except the game still had one final nail to put in my coffin. For some odd reason, whether it's a glitch or intended, whenever you leave a server and join a new one, the game takes away your hazmat suit. So when I spawned back, I was in the middle of a literal blast zone naked and I kept dying. I didn't have enough time to fast travel since I was over encumbered and the radiation killed me too quickly because majority of my health is radiation. So I left the game and got off for the night. Not only did it take me over an hour to launch the nuke, I couldn't even feel satisfied with my final reward of defeating the Scorch Beast Queen. While this was easily the worst experience I've had with the game, something like this has only occurred one time, where a ton of crashes happened within an hour or so. Most of the bugs that I found were hours or days in between each other, but this one was very different. Overall, 95% of the game functions like normal, which says a lot considering the state the game was on launch. If you were someone worried about the bugs in the game, then as a quick summary, Fault 76, like any game, does have the occasional bug and glitch. Bethesda has done an excellent job managing the bugs they had on launch, and if you really need proof, go look at some gameplay from day one, then look at the gameplay on screen. It's almost night and day. So if you were one of those people who were turned off from the severe lack of polish the game had on launch, you have very little to worry about now. Target acquired. Your damp vending machine's prices are outrageous. The only worst deal I've seen is the hand. You were dealt when you were born. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh.
Bethesda fixed most of the bugs so that the game still has a chance of being called a game, but also a Fallout game, but as we know, that's not all it takes to be considered one. Exploration is key to open world games, and especially games like Fallout, since its vast and unique world is always entertaining to explore. Within locations, you'll find terminal entries, notes, and hollow tapes that explain the stories of these small places. Sometimes the environment itself tells a story all on its own. The same can be said for Fallout 76. During my first couple hours into my playthrough, I came across a Mama Dulces, and as I was exploring, I found a keycard that seemed important, and I scoured the area looking for the entrance until I found it hidden in the sewers. Even in Fallout 3, Mama Dulces has been used as a base of operations for the Chinese, and it's the exact same thing here. Just in the beginning area called the Forest, you can find areas like this. There is Point Pleasant, which has ties to Mothman, an island inhabited by Deathclaws, and even a literal vault. Also, I think the Forest has the most locations out of the six regions in the game, so lots of your exploration content will be packed in here. That doesn't mean the other regions aren't worth it though. My two favorite locations in the game aren't even in the first area. The Garahan Estate in Ash Heap and the Monorail Elevator in the Savage Divide both offer stunning views of Appalachia. The elevator can even possibly see the nukes that go off nearby in Cranberry Bog. Obviously, Fallout isn't all about stunning views, so if you want some more interesting places, I highly recommend West Tech, as it's excellent for uncovering more stories about the FEV virus, as well as a transmission station deep in the forest. You'll come to the transmission station during the Brotherhood questline, so I won't spoil too much, but it's quite the interesting place. The beauty of Fallout has always been going to a place without knowing its history and uncovering it for yourself, so it'd be rude of me to spoil all the beautiful locations this game has as it ruins the fun. But do take my word for it, as someone who explores all the locations he can in any Fallout game, 76 made me feel right at home. Even though the game is multiplayer, that doesn't take away from the fun of exploring a new region of the map. It also doesn't take away from the quality and quantity of the locations as well. I don't have a completely accurate number as there's hundreds of locations across each game, but according to some sources, 76 has more locations than Fallout 4, which had around 325. Also, with this game being multiplayer, it's updated frequently, and almost every DLC update has introduced more locations, so it's only going to continue to grow. I also think I'm reaching with this point, but I think if you're new to a location, and have never visited before, then the enemies in loot will always respawn as to not confuse the player. It would be weird to walk up to an area you didn't know was cleared out, see there's no enemies, then come back an hour later on your next visit to find them all there. So I think at least for the first visit, especially when visiting indoor areas, the game will spawn stuff no matter what. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I do have strong suspicions that's the case. Earlier I mentioned the six regions. The game has six regions easily divided by the color schemes on the map. You have the forest, the toxic valley, ash heap, Savage Divide, The Mire, and Cranberry Bog. I'll explain this point more in the gameplay section, but most of these areas can be explored right away since most enemies scale to the player's level, but I highly recommend taking it one area at a time. For a couple days, I explored every location in the forest, then moved to the next region when I was finished. When entering a new area though, sometimes a new quest may pop up in your miscellaneous tab. For example, when going to West Tech, you'll receive a marker saying uncover the secrets of West Tech. This doesn't happen in every area though, just most of them. The quest may just be a simple as going to a different section of the building, forcing the player to look for the story themselves. Sometimes it leads to a daily quest like the one with Chloe, where it says investigate Berkeley Springs, but sometimes it's an official side quest. Like when entering the mire or bog for the first time, you'll get a distress call, which leads to a long-winded quest with an astronaut named Sophia. It's clear the exploration is there, and it rewards you for doing so. One big strong point to exploration in these games is the vaults, but for me, 76 doesn't really nail that feeling for me. While the exploration and excitement of uncovering a new area's secrets is still there, the vaults got the short end of the stick. All of the vaults are either inaccessible or unlocked through the completion of something other than Vault 76 and 94. Vault 51 is locked behind the Nuclear Winter Overseer levels, so the more you play the mode, the more you uncover, but not everyone likes Battle Royales, and it was also just released that the game mode's gonna be shutting down in September, so no one really knows what's gonna happen to the vault. Like I stated, Vault 94 can be explored as well as 76 without any requirements. Vault 96 and 63, however, just won't open. 96 is in the Daily Ops missions, but in Adventure Mode, out of the operations, neither can be opened, so they just sit there dormant. This is most likely due to the vaults being used for some other content years ago called Vault Raids, but that content was removed from the game, so now they just exist on the map. 
The last is 79, which is tied to the Wastelanders questline between the Raiders and Settlers, which while it does take a long time to finish the vault and story, it was very entertaining. While this game's vault accessibility and story are fairly okay, it's leagues behind the past games, where you could simply just walk into any vault and it was all accessible to you. Like I said, it got the short end of the stick, sadly. Fallout to me is a combination of a few things. It's got a post-apocalyptic setting, mysterious locations, captivating story, and unique gameplay. So far in the video, we've proved that 76 has nailed the first two, so let's talk about the last two bullet points. Fallout 76 is different in the way it handles its gameplay. This isn't a single-player game, it has to be tuned around multiplayer, which means an endgame, various options and methods of farming loot, viable builds, and giving the player enough to do. 76 can seem very intimidating at lower levels since enemies hit harder than it may seem, causing you to die quite a bit. But the gunplay is fun and simple. Your go-to shooting will still be with the help of vats, and surprisingly for a multiplayer game, it's very effective. It's originally a dumbed-down version of it, only allowing you to select the whole body, but you can then get a perk that goes back to that normal selective body part style of vats. Originally, I thought this was a waste of time, having to constantly move to the appropriate body part while being shot at, but it's incredibly helpful. Critical hits also return from Fallout 4, and they act the same. They do a good chunk of damage and always hit even if the chance is super low. To shoot or hit things, you're going to need weapons. Armor, weapons, power armor, and chemistry workbenches also return, but are a little different from Fallout 4. In Fallout 4, the player needed the appropriate perk level and the gun they wanted to mod to add attachments. Gun Nut allowed you to add mods to the gun, so increasing that was the way to go. This is the same thing for 76, except not everything is available to you. You not only need the plans for the gun, but also the mods as well. Well, and that's where the grind comes in, and it's actually balanced for both heavy and light weapons. Plans are either specific rewards from side quests like the combat rifle, or if it's not predetermined, then you'll have to farm events and dailies or just buy them. Mods are the same way, but you can dismantle the guns themselves to have a better chance of getting a mod. See, the combat rifle has dozens of mods you can unlock, but heavy guns like the minigun may have six or eight mods, so you would think go with the bigger weapons because they have less mods to find. But you have to remember that finding a minigun first is a lot harder than a combat rifle. Most guns with lots of attachments can be found easily on enemies, whereas bigger guns with less mods aren't as common. Of course, there are some exceptions. A popular weapon amongst the super mutants is a board, but the board only has three mods. So not everything is like this, but most guns tend to follow this dynamic, and all weapons are fairly acceptable to a degree. Thanks to the plethora of damage perks and the fact that enemies are now scaled to your rank and not the area anymore, you can pretty much use any weapon and it will still be effective. Originally, the White Spring Resort had some high-level ghouls that patrolled the area, but now there's scale to your level, not some preset number, which is very helpful for those who need to go across the map for a quest. After some time, you should be able to rank up, and 76 also does this differently than the previous entries. Firstly, everyone starts with 1 in every special stat. Every level from 1 to 50, you can add a special point to add to your stats, and the new max number is 15 as opposed to 10. You can do some interesting combinations with this, but it will have some drawbacks. On my current build, my luck and agility is at 15, but I have to sacrifice my strength for it. During these levels, you will also get perks, and every five levels you'll also get a perk pack filled with some extra cards. So the level up process is picking a special stat and then a card, but you don't have to choose the same stat. By default, if you select strength, the game gives you a list of strength perks, but you don't have to pick them. You could put points into strength, but choose an agility card, which is extremely helpful. And you can only put in as many numbers as the special stat has. So since I have a two in strength, my only options are two level one cards or one level two card. My luck, however, can be used freely since I have 15 points to play around with. To rank up your card, it's as simple as getting two of the same card and then combining it. If you want to get to tier 3, just add one more. And don't worry if you don't know what build or playstyle to use, since the game just added a punch card machine in the current season, locked and loaded, allowing you to customize your special points whenever you want, and have presets so you don't need to remember all of it. As surprising as it sounds, respecking your stats was not in the game until a couple months ago, so this is a perfect time for new players to join. To add to this, even past level 50, you can still get perk cards, so you don't need to worry about the build right away. Due to me going back and forth between ideas, I didn't finish my build at level 50 like you would expect. I finished it at level 68, and now since I'm a much higher level, I'm using that extra slot in the punch card to make another build, giving me more reasons to play. The biggest reason that perk cards are still available after level 50 is because you now have access to legendary perks. These can only be chosen at specific level milestones, 50, 75, 100, 150, etc. And to level them up, you need to use perk coins, which is gotten by scrapping the cards you don't want. These perks are incredibly helpful. One can completely bypass all terminals and locks up to a specific level, 
or you can buy one that increases one of your special stats unrelated to the current stats you have. So going back to my example, I can't change what I have. I'm stuck with two strength. But with that legendary perk card, I can raise my strength without sacrificing other stats. All these culminate into builds and play styles I discussed before. There's a lot of leeway in this game. Pretty much any gun can work at an above average level, especially with the large amount of additional legendary effects the game has. But it's not as simple as that, as most players have commented that there are very few top builds in the game. Yes, a shotgun or gunslinger can work, but there's tons of other builds just simply better than them. You may have noticed in the gameplay, 90% of my health bar is gone. This is to help with a legendary effect called Bloodied. The less health you have, the more damage you do. And since my build is built around sneaking, I'm getting incredible base damage on top of the sneak attack damage. It's not as foolproof as it may seem, as it does have lots of weaknesses, like the ability to get melted in the blink of an eye. But with a change of perks, you could put on some power armor and be almost invincible. Once again, this isn't the only build available. The game has tons of viable builds, but there's not a lot of top tier builds. But Bloodied isn't the only way to go. I've seen people use melee weapons at full health, holding their own against the toughest boss in the game, so it's definitely possible. But don't be surprised if you join a team and almost everybody has red health bars. I can't comment too much on this as I haven't had nearly enough experience to experiment with every build and weapon, but it does seem to be the general consensus in the community that there is very few top builds in the game, but there are quite a few viable builds that can work at an above average level. The biggest problem I can already see growing is the end game. Simply put, most players agree to some extent the end game in Fallout 76 is lacking. Currently for me, I still have lots of stuff to finish, so even 100 hours later, I'm content with what I'm doing, but for players who've been playing for years, it might not be that way. The endgame is a combination of a few things, keeping up with the daily quests and the daily ops, exchanging legendaries for script to get better chances at better legendaries, and exchanging treasury notes for gold to get unique plans, and overall just min-maxing the character. The other item on the checklist is farming the bosses, as they drop a few plans and some rare materials. Except there are only two bosses in the game, and one is farmed way more than the other, so you could really only say it's just the queen. Recently though, there was news about expeditions coming into the game, starting with the pit from Fallout 3 so maybe there will be bosses in there, which would definitely amplify the endgame tremendously. The last part of the gameplay section would be PvP, since this is a multiplayer game after all, but if I'm being honest, I don't really have much to say. Besides Nuclear Winter, which is all around PvP, I've never gotten into a shootout with another player. One person I saw on Reddit summed up this phenomenon quite well. When Bethesda marketed Fallout 76, they said it was a Fallout game with PvP, but the community saw it as Fallout with co-op. Most players are super nice and helpful. Without speaking a word, I've completed tons of daily ops and boss fights with no one communicating. There's numerous stories on Reddit that talk about people dropping their weapons by accident, and some players have grabbed the guns off the ground, but it was only so that other players didn't steal it from the original player. Even in my experience when I was around level 10, within a couple hours of each other, two level 300 players gave me 1,000 rounds of ammo and a very powerful level 10 pipe gun. This helped me clear that early game power struggle I talked about earlier. Now of course, not everyone will have this experience, so don't be expecting hand Outs, but a lot of people are super friendly in this game and willing to help out others, which is why I've never been in a shootout with another person. I even tried to start a couple fights myself, but with the way PvP works, if you shoot at someone, it does almost zero damage unless they shoot back, so it's a complete waste of ammo. So if you were someone who wanted to play this game to start fights with random players, it's probably not gonna happen. Overall, 76's combat and gameplay is fun, and it will keep you entertained for a while. There's enough content and dailies to do on top of the quests, locations, and material farming that you'll probably have too much to do rather than not enough, at least for a while. Currently at level 120, with nearly 100 hours in, I still have side quests to finish, a completely new build I want to create, regions to fully explore, and tons of building in my camp to do, so I'll be entertained for many more hours. So the gameplay and combat is captivating and engaging. The locations and atmosphere immerse you in the world, making you want to explore all the areas the game has to offer. The only thing we haven't discussed yet is the story. I know y'all weren't gonna start this party without me. Ain't that right, 7-6? Who are you? Name's Meg. I run the crater. And this is my crew. So for me, while the main story lacks a bit, I think it's absolutely carried by the other main quests added in the later DLCs. Of course, spoiler warning ahead if you don't want to hear any of this. So the main premise of 76 is that you leave the vault in search of the Overseer. You encounter a camp of hers that has a holotape, and then this points you to Flatwoods. 
Throughout the main story, you'll work and join various factions throughout Appalachia. Some are new factions like the Responders and Free States, but some are more recognizable like the Enclave and the Brotherhood of Steel. You do have to remember though, this is the game's main story, so this is when no human NPCs were introduced, so don't expect to find anything. It's mostly just hollow tapes and robots. The beginning section with the Responders is mostly about teaching you the basics of the game, like cooking and scavenging, and while learning the basics, you'll also learn a bit more about that Scorched Plague and ways to stop it. You'll then go through various factions like previously stated, and will end in you meeting with the Enclave and seizing control of a missile silo and using that missile silo to destroy the Scorched. Most of it, to be honest, felt like a drag to play through until the Enclave was introduced as things started to pick up speed, but overall it wasn't terrible. It didn't help that there were no human NPCs to feel connected to, it just felt like a string of side quests until you met Modus, one of the few characters in the story with actual personality. You could argue that Rose has some charm too, and you'd be correct. If anything, I find that she's more enjoyable to talk to than Modus, but but her quests were just not engaging at all. All of them felt like fetch quests and were just not memorable. The Enclave have always felt secretive and classified, so when Modus was very open to discussing the Enclave, I was all ears. It's not a terrible questline by any means, it's definitely nowhere as good as the past game's main story, but like I said, I think the DLCs more than make up for it. Wastelanders and Steel Dawn introduced two new storylines, taking place a year after the main story. Raiders, Settlers, and the Brotherhood of Steel have moved into Appalachia. The Raiders and Settlers questline is fun, allowing you to do actual missions with the Raiders. It's highly recommended though that you do beat the main story as a couple things may sound a bit confusing. For example, the first thing you do with each faction is to convince them to get inoculated so that more Scorched aren't created within Appalachia, as like I said, that was the whole point of the main story. You yourself get inoculated very early on in the game, so if you do this questline first, you may be a bit confused on what they're talking about. Eventually, you'll discover that nearby Vault 79 has the country's gold reserves inside, which as the Overseer explains, could be used to start a brand new currency and economy. Problem is, the security is extremely tough, so you need the help of one of the factions to break inside. The main quest showcases lots of ideals and beliefs from both factions. The Raiders of Crater, led by Meg, are a conglomerate of five smaller Raider groups, all of whom are different from one another, so those ideals they carry with them tend to clash a bit. The Settlers of Foundation are a large group of people that are just looking to survive the wasteland, so they are a lot more friendlier than the Raiders, as long as you're not an outsider. I really liked this quest line, and the rewards are excellent, as a new currency gold boolean was introduced, allowing you to unlock exclusive outfits and power armor. The only negative I have is something that's consistent across the game, and that's decision making. Bethesda doesn't give your actions consequences. I was under the impression that whoever I chose will like me and the others will hate me, but that's not the case. Both factions are very much alive and prospering, and they don't really care about my decision. In my playthrough I went with the Raiders, but I split some of the gold with Foundation. Clearly that wasn't the deal that me and Meg decided on, so I betrayed her trust. She said that that gold, the gold that was rightfully theirs, now has to be stolen back, which means I just made their jobs a whole lot harder. Meg should despise me for going behind her back like this, but I can still walk around Crater just fine without any issue. In fact, not even the Raiders bring this interaction up. Only Meg mentions it one time. Now, I do understand why they possibly did this. Once you hit certain tiers of reputation, you get more rewards, and Bethesda probably wanted all players to get all the rewards, which I commend them for, but then what's the point of choosing if there's no consequences? I literally betrayed an entire faction, and they still accept me as one of their own. It just doesn't make sense to me. The last DLC is with the Brotherhood of Steel during the Steel Dawn DLC, and they're led by a Paladin Romani. Under her is Knight Shin and Scribe Valdez, people who you will get to know throughout the story. Both Romani and Shin also have conflicting ideals. Shin's very by the book, wanting to maintain the structured order of command no matter what, but Romani doesn't want that. She wants to be free of the Elder's constant reign over them. These two clash constantly throughout the later parts of the story, and with the upcoming Part 2 DLC, Steel Rain, it may drive them to kill each other. Personally, I'm extremely excited for this to continue, as I really like the Steel Dawn questline, and from the looks of the trailer, we might actually get some consequences. Now, there are a million ways for Bethesda to not do that, but I'm hoping that we can actually get to kill one of them and live with our decision. This type of decision making is something that's drastically missing from this game, and I'm hoping Steel Rain brings it back. Both Wastelanders and Steel Dawn are excellent additions to the game, by not only adding new content in the form of quests, but also accompanying those quests with engaging stories and conflicts that make you want to continue playing. Doing these quests felt great, as it felt like a proper Fallout game again. I was so engaged in the storyline of the Brotherhood of Steel that I ran through it in one sitting, and I haven't done that in a very long time.
The last and arguably the most important part of this video is the microtransactions. Fallout has a shop accessible from the main menu called the Atomic Shop. Using the Atom currency, you can buy items from this shop. The positives to the shop is every day there's a free item that, while not always great, is nice to stockpile. Something helpful, especially for newer players, is that by checking the challenges menu, you can see some easy ways to get atoms. I currently have close to 3,000 atoms thanks to these challenges, and side note, I didn't even go out of my way to get these done. I just played the game like normal, and a bunch of them unlocked. I personally don't have an issue with the Atomic Shop, but this is only because I've purchased things from my camp, arguably the most important purchases from this menu, and I'm currently considering getting a skin for the 50 cal. However, some of these items are atrocious. At this exact time in my script, it's June 23rd, and two items just came to the shop. One is a display, and the other is clothing. Except the clothing is the Vault Tech guy's outfit from Fallout 4, and the display case, while cool, can only show off the masks from the Fashnot seasonal event, which hasn't come back in months. 500 to 700 atoms isn't a large price, but 700 atoms for a suit and 500 for a display case that is only for one specific item is just absurd. The other things that belong in this section are the seasonal scoreboard and the infamous Fallout First. The scoreboard is like a battle pass, and it's not purchasable. Every scoreboard is free, and I'm okay with free rewards, especially when some of them are actually pretty cool. I would say my only complaint, though, is that the scoreboard does have a large amount of consumables like carry weight boosters and lunch boxes, and not a lot of actual content like skins, outfits, or camp-related stuff, so more of those would be nice. The last is Fallout First, and this actually isn't that bad. Firstly, no one's gonna kill you anymore for having the subscription, so that worries out of the way. But for those who don't know, Fallout First is a subscription that is $13 a month or $100 a year, and this gives you access to a few things. You're given 1,650 atoms per month, which is actually a cheaper alternative than just buying the 1,650 atoms from the store by itself. You also get a scrap box, survival tent, access to exclusive cosmetics and rewards that are in the atomic shop or the scoreboard, and having the ability to start a private world. Honestly, and I think a lot of players can agree with me, the most important part of this subscription is the scrap box and the survival tent. The scrap box was helpful not only to alleviate the weight in my stash a bit, but also keep things organized and simple. This is a box with unlimited pounds of weight only for junk. So for people who want to hoard all sorts of junk or want to farm large amounts of a specific material, this is perfect. The best part of this is that most players will buy the subscription for a month, and a good portion of that month is spent farming materials, usually lead and steel for ammo. They'll cancel the subscription, and then depending on how many materials they got throughout that month, they may not have to purchase this subscription for another four months. When the subscription is gone, you can still take and use the junk from the scrap box, you just can't put any more junk in. The survival tent is like a home away from home. It has a bed, stash, scrap box, cooking station, and usually an instrument. The issue with farming materials is that you'll be over encumbered very quickly, and instead of walking to the nearest workbench, if there even is one, you can just plop down a tent anywhere and put all that junk in the scrap box. It's extremely efficient. The extra cosmetics are pretty cool too, but that's more subjective as some may find these rewards better than others. The last part is private worlds. Now, I did a lot of research on this. I wanted to do what I mentioned earlier, buy Fallout first, then farm for a month, but I wanted to make sure those items respawned. I never mentioned material farming that much in this video, and it probably belongs in the gameplay section, but it's very relevant here. Eventually, there will come a point where you need some material, and obviously you're going to want a lot of it fast. Thankfully, there's locations and enemies that can help with this, but in comes the problem of the game being multiplayer. To explain, let's show an example. I need some ammo, specifically 45 round ammo, which needs gunpowder, steel, and lead. I can knock the steel and lead out of the materials list with some tin cans. Thankfully, there are four chimes of tin cans that have nine cans per chime at the White Spring Resort, so what I do is I spawn in at the resort, run into the building, grab the chimes, and once I'm done, I server hop by leaving the game and joining a new one. Except the issue is that there's no way in two years I'm the only person who's discovered this. A good 70% of the time, the chimes are gone. This is all always going to happen, and it's not like I'm picking the get-rich-quick scheme either. The best item in the game for the most lead possible is weights. Weight rooms have tons of weights, all with various amounts of lead in them, and that is almost always taken, so I farm the cans, since it's not the fastest method, but it's definitely not the slowest either. Private worlds are also really helpful with nukes and workshops. You can claim the workshops in your private world, and no one's going to overtake them since you're alone, so you can set up extractors and extract the resources that way. And later in the game, flux can be very helpful for some crafting materials. A good way to find them is to nuke specific areas of the game and gather the flora that spawn there. Of course, the very last but most obvious benefit to this is no players will come and kill you and take your stuff. But personally, like I said before, my entire time on the game, I've only been killed one time. So while it's a really cool bonus, if you're buying Fallout first with the number one reason being so that
that players can't kill you, I think you're wasting your money. Overall, Fallout First is very much worth the money you're spending. Some people have said that buying this as a new player is not worth it, but once you get farther into the game and become a consistent daily player, it's definitely worth the $13 price, and I'm inclined to agree. An unlimited stash of scrap, the ability to place a tent wherever I want when I'm full, are easily the best reasons for buying the subscription, and it's something I definitely recommend. As much as Bethesda wants to forget about the past, everyone's going to remember Fallout 76 as Bethesda's worst blunder. This game was an unpolished mess on launch with very little incentive to grind, but now it's turned into one of my favorite games of the year. If you were like me, someone who wrote off the game and never returned, please give it one more try and see if you like the improvements. I've been checking the 76 Reddit frequently since I've started playing, and I've seen dozens of the same posts of people talking about the same thing I did. Going into the game again, not expecting much, but leaving having played one of the best games in recent years. With that, however, we've reached the end of the video. If you want to try Fallout 76 for yourself, I think it's close to $20 or $30, but if you are worried about that price, for Xbox and PC owners, you can pick up Game Pass for $5 and play it that way. As always, thank you for watching the video. Let me know what you think about the video as well. If you're new, make sure to subscribe for more content like this, and if you're a returning viewer, I thank you for coming back. Like always, everyone, take care, and goodbye.